Good early afternoon, everyone. Let's try it again. Good early afternoon, everyone. I have no doubt how many of you have had to do that in your classes, right? How's everyone doing? All right, all right. Happy 25th anniversary. Yes, yes. Never doubt for a second the power of what that means. And so I hope in the middle of this, this time that you're all together, that you sit with it, have a little meditation time, and realize that for 25 years you've been standing on the shoulders of others who have been working with young people, and feel great about that. So thank you. With that said, my name is Lisette Nieves, and you are officially at what panel? Anybody? Hi, Red. Oh. Can you guess that I was a professor for many years too? Yeah. <laughs> We're gonna talk about higher ed, and it's called uh, Evolving Higher Ed, and if I had a title, I was joking with our undersecretary, it would have been the revolution in higher ed. <laughs> because for anybody who's trying to make change and understand higher ed, if you go above a snail's pace, you feel like a revolutionary. Would you agree, panel, with that? Yes. <laughs> but we will stick with the title that we have. Um, let me tell you a little bit about uh, what's going to happen today. Uh, first, I'm honored to be here um, because it's always great to be in a room with educators. Um, for those, uh, the best educators, I always say, are the ones who learn from their students, right? right? If it's just going one way, if learning's one way, it's no good, right? The second is that learning is deeply emotional because it's tied to so many other things, right? Anybody ever got emotional in a classroom? No, oh, no, not this group, right? <laughs> Deeply emotional. And that doesn't mean that just because the stakes are high, right? The stakes are high. Um, and so I'm full um, of joy right now because I'm on a panel with people who've dedicated their careers to that and dedicated their careers to being really fearless about that and making change, particularly in higher ed. So for most of you, it's about getting them to higher ed, correct? And um, for many of you who've stayed in touch with your students, it's not so simple just getting them to, right? Right? The next question is, how do you get them through? Or what have been my biases in getting them to when I didn't think about an alternative pathway or credential that can allow them success as well, right? It's as much checking yourself, too. And so this panel represents a diversity of that. We have a large state system represented here that has done incredible work with data analytics. We have a great city system here that has probably doubled graduation rates and changed the way we think about alternative credentialing um, and has become a model. We have the undersecretary for higher ed here federally who, if you know anything about his background, and everyone will speak about their backgrounds, has been someone who's come to this work um, from a variety of different paths, quite entrepreneurial, and has never looked at things in a linear way. He's really a, a, a textured advocate around thinking about change. We have an alum of yours here on the panel too, how exciting, who has learned from her work in the classroom, has learned from the work at TFA, and then ultimately, what does it mean to link workforce and higher ed? And we also have a corporate partner on this board which is the employer and how they've had to think about what does talent mean, right? And, and for so many of our young people, what do they want to do? They go to school to do what? To find a career, to work, right? Have you heard that? Absolutely. And so not having an employer would be wrong. And we're really pleased to have her here at the table as well. The way the session's going to go is I'm going to do an overview kind of PowerPoint, just ground everybody in some numbers. Okay? Know that there's tons of numbers. With all the academics here, we could have numbers for 5,000 years. We're just taking a snapshot. The second thing we're going to do is we're actually going to um, separate the session into two sections where we're going to um, have a dis videos dispersed in there. Um, and so I want folks to kind of understand that too. And then we're going to also have a 15-minute Q&A at the end. Okay? And everyone sees the microphones there? All right, all right. So let's, let's get started. Um, I thought 
thought about thinking of a question about how we introduce ourselves as a little bit different. You heard me speak a little bit about the larger bios of folks, but I want to hear a little bit of folks about, A, they could introduce themselves, everyone, and I'll start first, um, your role, um, something about your higher ed experience, and what was critical to getting you to complete your higher ed experience, okay? Is that good, everyone? Mm -hmm. All right. All right, so um, as I said, my name is Lisette Nieves, and I am a first-generation college student. Um, that's an important part of my identification and thinking about that. My dad did not graduate from high school. My mother did. I'm a Puerto Rican from Brooklyn. Um, and so, did someone say woo? No? <laughs> yeah? Okay, yeah, woo, woo, woo. Okay, thank you. It's always good to feel it. <laughs> um, I did what 60% of college students do go to college less than 60 miles from their house. I was a commuter student. Although I was accepted to very fancy schools, I went to the public school system all my life. I went to the local city university out of a cost issue. And um, I would say I got through that because that was an institution that also understood three quarters were first generation college students. Um, and I had incredible advocates and I became the first Rhodes Scholar in that system. And I was really proud of that. I couldn't have done it without them. Um, uh, uh, the last critical thing that got me through school is that I knew that I could always work while I went to school. And I know that's not always a topic people want to say or think about, but I worked at least 25 hours a week, if not more. And work was just an important an identity to me as my academics were, because it was tied to my family. It was tied to my sense of me. And um, I didn't see that separation. So I understood my labor market as well as my academic market and had champions in both. So that's me. And with that, I get to pass it to my left. Good afternoon, everyone. And I too want to wish you a happy anniversary. I am coming up on my sixth anniversary as being a chancellor of the City Colleges of Chicago, which is one of the largest community colleges in the nation, but it's certainly the largest in the state of Illinois. Um, currently, we service over 100,000 students annually. We have over a $700 million budget, and I have over 5,500 faculty and staff. So that's one of the largest. A little bit about um, my college background, I think that's what you said. Okay, a little bit about my um, college background and a little bit about how I got here. So I think um, I can tell you, you know, I went to um, the Illinois Institute of Technology where I earned a Bachelor's of Science in Computer Science. I went to North Park University where I earned a Master's in Community Development and Public Policy. I went to Kellogg at Northwestern where I earned an Executive MBA. All that sounds great. But the most important degree that I have is the associate's degree that I earned from the community college that I am now a chancellor of. I have an associate's degree from Olive Harvey College, which is one of the seven community colleges that um, I am uh, now the chancellor of. But I think even more important than that, um, what I feel makes me uniquely qualified for this job, because I did come to this job out of the business sector, I was um, vice president um, for Commonwealth Edison, a subsidiary of Exelon, one of the largest utilities in the nation. I think what makes me most uniquely qualified, um, besides getting my, bachelor my um, a degree from Olive Harvey, is that I've literally walked in the shoes of the students that I serve today. I serve a hugely uh, minority population um, who come from low income areas. And I can tell you my story mirrors almost each one of their stories. Um, I grew up on the west side of Chicago in the housing authority. My, both my parents uh, suffered from substance abuse. I was homeless for a while, dropped out of high school, and now here I sit as chancellor. They need to hear that, they need to know that, and they need to know that they can achieve it. So, I quite often tell people I didn't leave my good paying uh, corporate job for the great government benefits that I have now. Um, when Mayor Daley called me to take this job, I was really moving quickly through the company. 
um, and probably on a track to excel more, and I left all of that voluntarily to do this, and I absolutely tell people I believe I left a career to take on a calling, and I think what was most critical for me to succeed through everything I've had to succeed through was the support, the support I had from people externally and the support I received from our community colleges internally, the advice, um, advisement that um, I received, and most importantly, I went into the community college starting with the end in mind. I knew I wanted to pursue a degree in technology. And so the best thing we could do is make sure our students have that going forward and that we are preparing them to start with the end in mind and we're preparing them for that from K through 12 all the way up through post-secondary education. Thank you. Oh, good afternoon. Anybody who's still awake? Come on. Good afternoon. That's much better. Well, um, happy 25th anniversary. I'm Mark Becker, president of Georgia State University, the largest university in the state of Georgia as of last month. More than 50,000 students actually spread across a main campus, if you will, a baccalaureate um, and graduate degree campus in downtown Atlanta, as well as five campuses in metro Atlanta region. Um, on the campuses in the metro Atlanta region, we have over 20,000 students. Um, they have an access mission. Uh, was formerly a two-year um, access institution and now is part of the university. And the downtown campus, instead of being an access institution, is highly selective, but is a major destination for students coming from two-year institutions and other institutions as transfers. We have a high transfer in, as well as a large um, four-year, if you will, student body, even though it takes five to six years mainly. Uh, we are one of the more diverse institutions in the United States of America, uh, based on race and ethnicity alone. Uh, we are a majority minority, but that's not just um, African American and Caucasians, it's also Asian Americans and Hispanics, as well as students who self-identify as mixed race. And we also have a very large international student population, more than 1,500 students um, on our downtown campus alone. Uh, one of the things that we've done to, uh, over the past decade plus is, and I believe one of the very few, if not the only institution in the country, to eliminate all disparities in graduation based on race, ethnicity, or income. And I know that'll come out later in this program. Now, my path to where I'm at is actually not going to be dissimilar than some of the things you've heard from uh, Lizette and Cheryl. Uh, my parents were high school graduates, but they were high school graduates when they were only 11 years. Uh, I was one of three sons, the middle son, and we were raised with the expectation we'd go to college because that's the way you get ahead in the United States of America. Um, however, at the age of 17, being a high school graduate, I had no idea what I wanted to do. Um, I knew what I was decent at, which was mathematics. I knew that I hated reading and writing, and so I just didn't know what I wanted to do, and I really didn't want to go to college. Uh, but I believed, I trusted my parents, I believed in them, so I started at a community college, Harford Community College in Harford County, Maryland. Um, however, I am a failure in Cheryl's world. I do not have an associate's degree. Uh, I, did, I, I did figure out what transfers and how to get to a baccalaureate degree, and so I transferred to Towson State University, uh, getting my bachelor's degree in mathematics. And what I'll say is one of the pivotal moments there, and this is one of the things I talk about all the time, particularly when people get too excited about the use of technology. And believe me, as you hear this program at Georgia State, we're all invested in technology. Uh, but the role of the, the professor, just like the role of the teacher, cannot be replaced. And for me, it was two professors, Martha Siegel and Oho Kim, yes, right. who touched me on the shoulder and said, have you thought about, and in their case, have you thought about going to graduate school and becoming a professor? And that's what changes lives. They're the people like you, the teachers and the professors who get to know their students and recognize the opportunity in them and tap them on the shoulder, whether metaphorically or for real, and say, have you thought about? So thank you for all you do, and we're very excited to be part of this. Happy anniversary and good morning. My name is Jimmy Peschel. I am with Wells Fargo and I lead diversity and inclusion and strategic philanthropy there. And from a strategic philanthropy perspective, I have responsibility for our financial education, which is very important for our students in terms of understanding money, how to make money work for you. I also partner with some other leaders on managing 100 plus national relationships um, that we have at Wells Fargo. And I want to tell you a little bit about my story, which is, which is a bit different. So I was expected to go to college. My parents both went to college and to graduate school. So my parents met at Howard. Um, they were, my father was in dental school. My mother was an undergrad. My grandfather was actually a dentist. 
And so this is back, my parents graduated from college in the 60s, and my mother was devastated to leave Washington, D.C., and to move back to Macon, which was very racially segregated at the time. And so I actually grew up um, going to segregated schools. My parents sent us to a Catholic school that was near my father's office, where I was the only black and the only Protestant in my class from the third through the eighth grade. And Jimmy's my real name. Uh, it's my family name, so people teased me that I was a boy. But the whole concept of education and quality of education and ensuring good education has always been very important to my parents. There was an expectation, though, that I would be a dentist. <laughs> and I had no passion and interest for doing that. So I went to Howard, and once I got to DC, I was convinced that I was not going to go back. So I majored in communications, and the summer after my sophomore year, I ended up doing an internship uh, with a TV station and realized that I was going to be basically following fire trucks and ambulances, I mean, telling sad stories is what I learned that summer. And I thought, I've got to figure something else out because I know I don't want to go home. And so I took a part-time job uh, my junior year in college as a gift shop clerk at a Marriott hotel. And I graduated with my communications degree and I went full-time in the gift shop. My parents were horrified. <laughs> my friends were going to Harvard's Law School and Wharton Business School, and I was taking quarters for newspapers um, in the morning for you know, basically a minimum wage job. But I learned a lot about myself, and I learned a lot about the power of work in that, because I did that job as well as I could possibly do it. In about six weeks, uh, after graduating from college, the human resources person comes up to me and says, do you like the hotel industry? And I said, yeah, I think it's great. She said, well, I've been actually hired to open the JW Marriott. So to tell you how long ago this was, this is when they were looking for the HR director of the JW Marriott Hotel, and she was going to go there to open that hotel, and she wanted to train someone to leave in the human resources department at the property where I was working. And so that led me to a 17-year career uh, in human resources with Marriott. I ended up moving from the property level to corporate headquarters. And in the Q&A, we'll talk a little bit more about sort of those pivots and decisions, but having the confidence to know that I, I needed to go to school and wanted to go to school, but didn't necessarily want to follow the path and expectation um, that my parents had for me was sort of a significant uh, choice in my life, I think that has opened up the world of opportunities um, that I've had to date. Hi, my name is Ami Eubanks Davis. I'm a 1995 alum. Yes. So I'm very excited for us today to have our 25th anniversary. Um, I grew up in the south side of the city of Chicago in low-income neighborhoods. Um, I'm one of 32 first cousins on one side of the family alone. And given my parents' uh, shaky real estate business, uh, happens to be in a neighborhood that gentrified pretty quickly. Um, it's now uh, seven blocks away from the Obama home. My older sister and I basically uh, had the opportunity to have life opportunities open up to us that were pretty different than many folks who we were close to in our neighborhoods and also in some cases our family members. So we ended up going to high school um, in a suburban high school where it was very clear that even though we were getting further opportunities, the opportunities of our peers um, had been significantly different than ours. Um, and the expectations of us coming out of Chicago public schools was much lower as I was counseled into remedial classes. Thankfully, my mom uh, pissed, pitched a big fit and basically made it possible for me to be in honors and AP courses um, but it was never lost on me that I uh, had been incredibly fortunate um, to have her as such a huge advocate, and it's what made me do Teach for America after graduating from Mount Holyoke um, in 1995. And I taught sixth grade social studies and language arts in New Orleans. I fell in love with my students in that city, and this is pre-Katrina, um, and I, well, at the time I left seven years later, I was one of the longest alums in New Orleans, and people kept asking me why I was still there, and it was that I fell in love with my students and their families, and I kept realizing that I was playing this interesting role in helping them bridge into the next thing. So whether it was high school, then all of a sudden they were considering college and career. And when I left, my students who had decided to go to college um, were entering college at a time where I hadn't thought a whole lot about higher ed, honestly. I just encouraged them as their teacher and told their parents that that's what they should do. 
Um, but at the same time, I ended up coming on the staff of Teach for America, where I ended up being for 13 years, and for the majority of that time, I ran the human capital shop. And it was during the big peak years when we were recruiting 50,000 young people for the teaching corps, which a lot of people knew. But what a lot of people didn't know was that we were recruiting another 30,000 young people to the staff of Teach for America, because we were opening up like a couple hundred roles um, every month or so. And what was really crazy is as my students started to come out of undergrad, some of them were trying to actually become core members. And I was having a complete anxiety attack along with a number of other folks on the staff of Teach for America who had students beginning to try to compete to get into the core who'd done everything right. Um, and we were watching them really struggle to meet our selection bars. There was a lot that we needed to do and did do to reduce the bias in terms of the selection bar. And yet I also knew so many other employers were not gonna do that and I started to wonder what was happening in higher ed, in particular in career services, that a student could do everything right and not come out and really be able to compete for a strong first job. And then it really led me to think back to going to Mount Holyoke, which is a small school, and basically having my posse there um, which really helped to push me through that school, but also there was a person in career services who joined the career service team when I walked into the career services office in November, not knowing what I was gonna do, who basically coached me through getting ready to get into Teach for America, interestingly enough. Um, and so this journey for me has definitely been through the lens of myself, but also through watching my own students not fully launch into the workforce and while also sitting in an organization recruiting and hiring a whole bunch of talented folks who needed to look more and more like our former students. Uh, good morning, good almost afternoon. Everybody, happy anniversary. My name is Ted Mitchell, and I uh, currently have the privilege of um, serving as the Undersecretary of Education in the U.S. Department of Education. Um, my portfolio is um, higher education policy. Our team uh, does all higher ed policy, uh, higher ed regulation. Uh, we oversee federal student aid. Um, which I think is the fifth largest bank in America at the moment. Um, and uh, we also uh, do workforce development and adult education, reentry education for prisoners. Uh, and we think hard with a series of six White House initiatives about how we really can use education as a tool for equity and, and social justice. Um, to give you a little sense of how I um, uh, ended up here, I want to take you back to dinner table conversations around the, um, the Mitchell, Mitchell family household when I was growing up. Uh, my grandfather was a prison guard at San Quentin. And my dad was a teacher and counselor at a high school, low-income high school uh, nearby. And uh, we spent many of our uh, uh, evening discussions talking about this very, 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 very thin wall between uh, success and achievement and prison and a very different alternative um, future. So we talk about the prison, the school to prison pipeline today. Um, that's a long conversation in my household, in my, in my life. And so when we talked about the family expectation that our three boys, my, my brother, two brothers and I, that we would go to college, um, it was twofold. We would go to college because it was the way to get ahead, it was the thing to do, but we would go to college if and only if we went to college to make a difference in the world. And if and only if we went to college um, to be able to take that very thin barrier and make it uh, um, something that was much different, create opportunities for everybody. Uh, so my brothers and I have kept that in mind. Um, when I was thinking about where to go to college, I knew that I wanted to be a teacher. I wanted to be like dad. Um, but I also knew that teachers make an enormous difference in people's lives because teachers have made an enormous difference in my life. So I uh, went off to Stanford to become a teacher. Uh, going to Stanford was a big deal for us. We couldn't afford it. So I worked every day that I was in college, um, most nights. The most interesting job I had was as um, uh, one of the guys who locked the doors uh, around campus in the middle of the night. You actually learn a lot walking around a residential <laughs> college campus uh -huh. at 2 a.m. I still have pictures, and those have become quite valuable. Um, <laughs> Um, but, you know, I'm, I, so I'm, I'm, I made it through, uh, and along the way, uh, um, had a number of those experiences that I bet many of you, if not all of you, have had. And certainly the students we want to serve, the most vulnerable students, have every day, which is that sense, oh my God, 
I don't belong here. I do not belong here. I remember it like it was yesterday. I remember where I was sitting in the classroom. I remember what was happening. I remember looking around. I remember feeling like I was the only person who didn't get it and didn't belong. We're going to talk a lot about how we build structures and ideas about how to, how to get over and through that and in some cases avoid it. For me, uh, getting over that and getting through that was, um, as, as Mark said, and as we all know, it's the human interaction uh, with, in this case, uh, the person who led my freshman seminar. And I went uh, into his office and I basically said, I'm leaving. I don't belong here. I'm going to call my parents and, and leave. And he worked me through that. He talked me over that, over that hump. I'm grateful they did, uh, and he and I have been um, dear, close friends ever since. In fact, uh, he was the best man in my wedding. Um, and so the relationships that you develop with your students, the relationships that we all develop with our students or that we've developed with mentors, uh, shape us in ways that uh, are, are important at the moment. But as you go back, uh, those of you who are in the classroom, those of you who are principals, as you go back, remember that the things that you do um, are memorable for a lifetime for the people you touch. So um, thanks for doing that. I just want to encourage you. So uh, I left, left Stanford, um, uh, decided I wanted to uh, uh, teach, but I wanted to do it at the higher ed level. So when I say I left Stanford, uh, it was five minutes uh, because I have no imagination. And so I stayed uh, at Stanford for graduate school. I got a master's degree in history, a PhD in the history of American education. And um, then followed the hardest conversation I ha ever had with my father because he regarded this PhD thing uh, as not quite hitting the bar for making a difference in the world. And when I told him that I was going to go teach at a small liberal arts college in New Hampshire, uh, Dartmouth, <laughs> uh, he said, you've given up. Those people don't need you. Um, so uh, I thought he was wrong, and I still think he was wrong, because you know, we all need that sense of passion about making a difference and doing what we can from where we are in the world. And many of my Dartmouth students, um, uh, some maybe even in the room, have gone on to, to uh, do things that would make my father proud, and certainly make me proud. Um, but uh, my meaning as an academic, my meaning as a teacher and an administrator has always been around making a difference and creating platforms for social justice and opportunities for people who've never had them. So from Dartmouth, I went uh, to UCLA, became the dean of the School of Education and vice chancellor there, uh, moved from UCLA to uh, Occidental College, where I was president, proudly the president of one of the finest and most diverse liberal arts colleges in the country. Uh, and um, after Occidental, uh, I, I, I had this experience that many college presidents do of kind of going to the same high schools to recruit um, underrepresented students and finding that I was chasing after the same five African-American students that the President of Pomona was and President Stanford was and Mark was. Uh, and I just sort of said, you know, that's not okay. I'm on the wrong side of the ball. We need to widen the pipeline. We need to do more uh, to broaden opportunity for underrepresented students uh, at the K-12 system, increase the quality of the K-12 education system, uh, and do it uh, uh, now. Um, and so uh, I took on two roles. Uh, one, I, I went, to, I'd been involved in the New Schools Venture Fund from its founding, um, but took on a full-time role at the New Schools Venture Fund and worked with a terrific group of colleagues and philanthropists uh, to build out charter schools that proved that all children can succeed, that built out uh, alternative teacher training programs that built out education technology companies, all of which were designed with a single aim in mind, which is to create opportunities uh, where opportunity hadn't existed before. And so we broke as many rules as we could find, as often as we could, with as much passion as, as, we, could, as we could muster. So uh, uh, that experience was um, on, the, on the frontier of what's possible. At the same time, I took on the role as president of the California State Board of Education um, to really see what kinds of policies were in place, uh, spoken and unspoken, that needed to be rectified uh, to create the kinds of opportunities that we need. Uh, it was interesting to me, we'll come back to it, the first vote that we took when I joined the board uh, was about the maximum weight of a textbook. Uh, how, how heavy should a textbook be? And too often that was the level of the discourse uh, that we had about state policy and that uh, was wrong. We tried to change it. Um, 
fortunate enough uh, to uh, receive a call from Secretary Duncan asking me to come to the department uh, to take on the higher ed portfolio several years ago. And we've been working, uh, um, our team has been working uh, to try to create innovation both in the federal government and through the federal government's resources and policies across, uh, across the space of higher education uh, aimed directly at getting underrepresented first generation or minority students into and through college. Access, affordability, and outcomes are the mantra we live by every day. And we will for the next 348. <laughs> All right. Well, everyone, um, there is this line that in order for a true trusting and learning educational experience to happen, you should know who's involved, right? We don't have the chance to introduce all of you, but you got a sense of who we are, correct? Um, and I would say it's a pretty interesting panel, to say the least. Um, with that said, the session, the way that's going to work is we're going to talk particularly about the supports for underrepresented students, and then we're going to go put right into workforce. And as the facilitator extraordinaire for all of you, I get to make all those calls, thank you panel, where I get to cut off people, <laughs> I get to switch things around, none of it's ever personal, we're just trying to keep moving it forward. Is that cool with everyone? Yeah. Yeah. All right, fun times, fun times up here. All right, with that said, I want to talk to you about a couple of numbers that are up there. No, these are aggregate national numbers. They are not numbers that are represented regionally. They are not numbers that are represented by race and class. They're not numbers that are represented by the four-year system versus the two-year system. And because I think those are actually really important to do, but we, we like I said, we'd be here for 5,000 years. 50% of all first-generation college students are from low-income communities, right? 50%. When, if I look to my left, to the chancellor, many of our community colleges have up to 90%, right? So just giving perspective for folks. Four-year universities, if they're a research tier in university, we could see as low as 10% needing financial aid, receiving federal financial aid versus others. Correct, President, right? It varies. It varies considerably, yes. If, so, so it's important for folks to understand that too. What are the environments where are we talking about? The second is, in six years, 40% of first-generation students will have earned a bachelor's degree and associate's degree. 55% of their peers who attended, whose parents attended college. 40% um, within six years. Now, there's been a lot of debate on this about what is the length of the school year, <laughs> right? How many credits? I mean, it's not as simple as you think, right? Quite a few people here have been on the cutting edge of that. How do we think about that? How do we think about the way adults consume higher education? And if we think differently about that, we can shift some of these numbers too. We are stuck often, too often, in a 1950s paradigm of what we assume how students consume higher ed. It's actually less than 25% go away to a four-year residential college. Did you get that? Less than 25%. Can you raise your hand if you went to a four-year residential college? Okay, there we go. So this is fascinating for me because already, already your sense or perspective of college is framed by your experience, which is not what the majority of the students are going to experience going to college. Do we get that? So all of you, when you think about college and you think about your students, are going to experience some cognitive dissonance. You are. You're going to be challenged, right? And I'm hoping that this is part of that challenge, right? Um, the next thing is students from high-income families are eight times more likely to get bachelor's degrees by the time they're 24 years of age, right? We know that. We also didn't put the numbers up there of how clear and stark SAT scores can be predicted by what? Zip income. code. Zip code. Family income, right? We didn't do that, right? That should present some cognitive dissonance in this room. Right? So that's just some numbers. A little sobering, no? Reality check for some of us. Inspirational numbers. It's about moving those needles, right? And we're going to go right into looking at supporting low-income students, OK? And with that, we're going to do a very quick video. And then we're going to go into some Q&A for our panels of I get to ask the Q&A this time. And then we'll make sure there's room at the end. Good with everyone? Let's rock and roll.
Okay. Guess what? That two-minute video is not going to happen. <laughs> but what is going to happen is that we have more than enough experts on this panel that could speak to particularly the challenge that they are seeing with low-income students, right? There's no question. I should probably give you some context, too, that in seven weeks, I'm defending my dissertation exactly on this topic. And my fourth grade teacher will be in there, in that room. So when you think about the role and impact you have, as well as some of my college professors, so uh, I think that's kind of a lovely full circle. Mom has to sit outside the room. She can't handle the grilling. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Trust me, you'd rather have it that way. <laughs> um, with that said, when we think particularly about low-income students and we see the variance of where they're located, I can't help but go to you first, Chancellor, and talk particularly about the work that you've done Thank you. since overwhelmingly and almost exclusively these are the students you're serving. Can you exactly. talk a little bit about the challenges and how you've made reforms to support their persistence and completion. Yes. Um, so knowing that um, Lisa. she, Lisa really will cut me off, I'm going to try to make my um, comments uh, very quick, but to the point. So I can tell you what four of the main uh, struggles that we see with our students. One is cost, for certain. Although community colleges remains the uh, lowest cost option for students, I think people still don't realize that cost is still a barrier for some students. There's many reasons why they may not qualify for financial aid. And if they are dealing with huge remedial issues, which is another barrier I see, a lot of their financial aid could be used up trying to repeat high school all over again, which is what we're reversing at City Colleges. So that's why we created at um, City Colleges of Chicago the STAR Scholarship. And many of you may have heard about this um, uh, nationally and uh, locally, but the STAR Scholarship for all of our um, Chicago public school students who receive a B average and are what we call completion ready because at City Colleges we look at completion ready versus college, um, uh, college ready, which is a whole different conversation. Their education is free for up to three years. So they get free associate's degrees up to three years and it is worth the, um, worth the investment. Preparation is another um, struggle that we see a lot with our students. So over 80% of our students are in some need of remediation in math, English, and reading. So that remains a huge barrier, but we're doing um, things like co-requisites, which you've probably heard a lot about. But basically, I can tell you what that means is we try to assess a student's need based on where they want to be and where they want to go. So we've created clear pathways around the seven industries that's going to dominate our region over the next 10 years. And so we try to educate them on what that is, what those uh, opportunities are. We try to figure out what their career path is, and then we educate them towards that career path and the gaps that they have in that career path. Um, as opposed to let's educate everybody in the world to get a 20 and above, 21 and above on the ACT and SAT. So that's what we're doing there. Um, then structure. Structure is huge. Many of our students have to work. They have families. They have other outside obligations. So if they come into our institutions and you just hand them a big catalog and you say, okay, put life together for yourself, figure out which classes you need to take, and then let's hope and pray that they may be available when you go to register. That won't work. That won't work for someone who doesn't have to juggle uh, a family. So we've taken all of our um, programs. First, we've looked at relevancy, made sure they're relevant, that they're getting credentials of value. Then we've taken every program at City Colleges and put them in semester by semester pathways. So when a student come and enrolls with us, they're enrolling in a program and not a class. And that program is already mapped out for them. That goes along with the fourth uh, issue, which is predictability. We all need some sort of predictability in our lives. So now we've taken those structure pathways and we've, we're now starting to put them in blocks of time so that students can come in. We help them decide what they want to be when they grow up. They choose that. The program is laid out and they can now choose a block of time in which they can take it. And so now they can structure work, family, and 
everything else they have to do in life around that block of time for the entire length of their program, whether they're there for six months or whether they're there for two years. So we're trying to address um, relevancy, making sure that every credential that they get is either valuable in the workplace or transfers to a four-year institution. We're addressing structure, we're address, addressing uh, supports, and we've put in a ton of supports from wellness centers to more advisors, and we're addressing predictability. Thank you, Chancellor. And if any of you get the chance to talk to Chan Chancellor after this, we should also recognize that when she went in, what was the completion rate? Oh. So when, um, <laughs> yeah, when I went into City Colleges, the completion rate was 7%. Yes, the number after six and the number before eight, seven. <laughs> and I'm sure you all know that, but I didn't want you to think you heard 70 when I said seven. It was 7%, but since then, we've increased the iPads graduation rate by 140%. And so it's more than double. Mm -hmm. We think about this notion of data analytics, right? Some of it is who are the students, right? And we could use data analytics for an equity agenda or an exclusion agenda, right? We can, very easily. Well, I'm proud to say that the president we have represented here on this campus, it's um, on this panel, it's about an equity agenda. And I'd love to hear from you, particularly how did, how did you go about building a system to get the data to have the outcomes you have? Because I want folks to understand that when you say that your completion rate is inclusive is such a powerful thing to say, particularly on a state level. So I, I, I do not want that to be ignored, and it didn't happen overnight, but if you can talk to that. Well, certainly, and that's back to the remark I made earlier about the interface between technology and human beings. Yeah. Um, our, our efforts are actually led by a Dartmouth graduate, Ted, so you, you've had a good impact. Uh, Dr. Timothy Rennick, but Tim, Tim was, a, was actually the founding chair of our religious studies department, and mm -hmm. he found religion and data. Uh, and that is when he um, took his role in the provost's office to help increase our graduation and retention rates, which used to be that one third of the students who started with us ended up with a bachelor's degree in six years, and wanted to move those numbers up significantly so that they are higher today than the numbers you put on the um, screen by a large measure, uh, start looking at the data. And you start looking for the low hanging fruit where you can make the first interventions. Uh, but what became immediately obvious as he dug into his work and we started to make progress was A, we needed to galvanize uh, the community around the goal that basically the, level, the playing field should be level. It shouldn't matter who your parents are and where you grew up. That if you've been admitted to the university, you should succeed. And so in our strategic planning process, uh, the first goal in our strategic plan is to establish a national model demonstrating that students from all backgrounds can achieve academic and career success at high rates. So, okay, be it very clear, that is the goal. All backgrounds, regardless of race, ethnicity. In fact, race and ethnicity don't figure into how we run our programs, how we design them, nor does stage of life, because we graduate students in their 80s and we graduate students a little bit over 18, 19 every year. What we did is we basically put together a database that has all the information we have on all the students yes. in one place and start analyzing that and actually eventually built with um, working in partnership with the private sector, a predictive analytics system where every night the data gets updated, more than 400 variables. Now, not every variable changes every day. Some only change once a semester at most. Uh, but every, the data set gets updated every night and then it gets checked against every single undergraduate student, more than 25,000. And if some change in the data suggests the student needs help, that student and, their, and his or her advisor get communicate, a communication that they need to meet. Last year, 43,000 face-to-face meetings between advisors and undergraduate students. 43,000. And it can be that you've made a financial change, you, that an academic change has taken place, any number of things. On top of this, and I'll, I'll, I'll wrap it up with this, is the predictability that uh, Chancellor Hyman talked about. Predictability. We can tell you in your freshman year whether or not you are in the right major, meaning whether or not you are in a major that you are likely to graduate. It's no more students who think they're going to be nurses and finding out in their junior year they're not going to get into the nursing program. We know that in their freshman year. The system we've built does that for every single major. And if they're not on the right pathway, 
you, this, they get that alert, they sit down with the advisor, and they start talking about their options and what kind of life they want to have, what their dreams are, and we build into that data systems about careers, uh, job titles, types of work they can do, salaries, all that information. So it's a very data-rich environment, but the advisors and ultimately the professors are the ones who touch the people and change their lives. How many one-on-one -on -one conversations does everyone want to have here, right? <laughs> I mean, I'm ready for some more. Undersecretary, I'd love to hear from you from the national perspective of, of how you've worked on this federally to think about this as an issue, and what are some initiatives coming up that you believe can move the needle on the numbers you presented? Great. Um, and I, I want to say that I'm a huge fan of everybody on, uh, on the panel today, and I, I think as we think about where this work takes place, it's always important to remember, as we've heard from the Chancellor and the President, that the most important work happens in the field, on the ground, yes. um, with students. And so everything that we do is in support of, of that work. Um, we're all uh, about changing the completion numbers because we know from our research and our analytics that the, the, that the underrepresented students who are worst off in this higher ed exchange are those who start who accumulate debt, yes. uh, who sacrifice time doing other things, and who leave without the benefit of that degree. Yeah. As Secretary Duncan said in one of his last speeches, the most expensive degree is the one you don't finish. Yes. Uh, and, and that is um, doubly true for the vulnerable students we're talking about because they don't have family resources to fall back on. Uh, and so one of the things we're very concerned with is um, setting up the conditions for completion. So a couple things. Cost. Um, we've invested uh, m uh, in Pell Grants uh, in two ways. We have increased the number of students who uh, are able to get, get Pell Grants. We've, we have increased the uh, uh, value of those Pell Grants. Uh, in the budget that the President will release on Tuesday, uh, we're making additional advances in the Pell Grant program. One of the things that research tells us is that in addition to all the things that we've heard about, uh, predictability being uh, um, sort of the most germane is that uh, trajectory and course taking intensity really matters uh, and you need to stay on track and and one of the weirdest things is that uh, currently Pell Grants aren't available for somebody who wants to continue their education during the summer so we're proposing making Pell Grants a year-round opportunity for students so that they can keep going keep going keep going and get their degree uh, at least on time, but maybe even in three and a half years, four years, uh, uh, and we, 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 we care about that a lot. Uh, Cheryl's, um, Cheryl noted the path-breaking uh, program in Chicago to make two years or three years of community college free. Um, the president uh, was so impressed by that and by the statewide experiment in Tennessee that I think you know that he has proposed uh, that the first two years of community college ought to be free for every American, and that we have to think about uh, some higher education as the new normal, that universal publicly supported education can't end at 12th grade, also can't start at kindergarten, has to start in pre-K and has to go through 14th grade. We're committed to pushing that uh, both in the Congress and in state legislatures across the country. Uh, so we're, we're working hard at that front end on, that, on, the, on, the, cost, on the cost side. Um, on, the, on the back, uh, also new, a new experiment, uh, Chancellor and I were talking about this before we started. Um, we also know that in many high schools, dual enrollment is one of the ways that students mm -hmm. begin to think of themselves as college goers and begin to accumulate college credits that really matter. Um, that saves money. Um, but here too, uh, um, there's no federal support currently available to, to low-income yes. students who want to do dual enrollment programs. And so yeah. uh, we're uh, uh, launching an experiment uh, in the fall uh, to provide Pell Grant money for low-income students to do dual enrollment courses uh, in high school. So we, we think on the, on the access side, uh, the, the, on the, especially the finance side, we've got, we've got a, a lot going on. And we think that some of these things, like uh, the Pell, uh, Summer Pell, uh, also creating a bonus for students who are taking 15 units yes. instead of 12 units mm -hmm. to stay on track, that we're really beginning to put in place the tools that schools and individuals can use uh, to address the completion problem. Great. Thank you. Um, the 
The last question I'll ask on this before we go into talking about workforce a bit more since we have set, certainly a lot of talent that can speak to that on this panel is this idea of, um, I just spent a, a, about three weeks in Phoenix looking at community college students and many talked about the ACE program and some are entering community college with 36 college credits. So literally said, Lisette, I'm gonna go to a four-year college. Think about it, I already did this. Now this was important because these were DACA students, right? These were students who knew that they were not gonna be able to access financial aid, right? And so this was an important piece about what does it mean to really be a dreamer, right? So our president knows here from Georgia, I'm gonna ask him this question. Because when we think about half a million, and we think about that particular population, how many work with folks, young people, dealing with documentation issues, yeah. Um, I should raise mine too. <laughs> how, do we, how do you think about that population? What's going on in Georgia right now? And I know that if anybody's been watching the news feeds, it's been a, it's been a little bit contentious in Georgia. So I, I'd love to just hear from you. Well, in Georgia, uh, the university system of Georgia, which is there's one higher education, public higher education system for the state of Georgia. And the policy of the Board of Regents mm -hmm. is that uh, for undocumented students, they can attend public institutions that have admitted all qualified Georgians for the previous two years, which means in some cases for a small number of institutions that undocumented students can attend. Um, in addition to that, uh, undocumented students cannot get in-state tuition. So most recently, uh, that was, yeah. the Board of Regents was sued, went to the state Supreme Court, and the state Supreme Court basically said the Board of Regents have sovereign immunity, mm -hmm. uh, therefore the case is dismissed, and that was a unanimous opinion of the state Supreme Court. And that has led to some recent um, protests and occupations of several campuses and, and arrests, quite frankly. Uh, the situation is in Georgia is that uh, yeah, that's a Board of Regents policy. The Board of Regents can change the policy or the courts can change the policy, but that's the way it is right now. Yeah. I want to recognize that our Chancellor also in her STAR scholarship allows undocumented students to access that as well. And so, um, but I want to also recognize President Becker is a personal champion as well. And this is also about what are systems that are happening within states that not even our undersecretary has the power to change because he would if he could, I have no doubt. But I, I didn't want that to be ignored in here. So for many of you who are working with DACA students, look on the White House Initiative for Educational Excellence for Hispanics and there's a great workbook and about how to think about college and college options for those with DACA, okay? With that said, I'd love to go to workforce. Yeah, how many of your young adults, young students, talk about work as a result of college? Yes, how many, right? Yes, this is a big deal. I'm going to college to do what? Work, right? I'm not going to college to find myself, to put my backpack on, go through Europe. I'm not against any of those. I think those are all incredible. Trust me, I want to put on a backpack and go through Europe. But, <laughs> but, um, but those notions are different today. And um, I'm actually gonna start from the highest level on this with the undersecretary talking about this, of how, how, how are we seeing, not an evolution, a revolution in thinking about workforce and competencies on a federal level. And then I'd love to go to our incredible employer and also to Ami, who's gonna talk about her program and works with that. Great. Thank you. So I'm gonna get the numbers they won't be precise, but they will be at least in the ballpark. Um, one of the most fascinating uh, um, surveys in our world in the last uh, year was a survey that was uh, given to um, pr university provosts and uh, um, whether it was HR uh, hiring officers at, in um, uh, major corporations across America. Question, um, how well are college graduates prepared for the world of work? Um, provosts. Um, who are usually a dour group were particularly enthusiastic <laughs> yeah. about this, and 94% of them said, they're good. Right. Right. Corresponding number from the corporate world, 11. Exactly. Yes. yes. Exactly. Right? So there's a great conversation that, uh, that, that has been going on for years, and this just illustrated that there is um, at least a mismatch in the way people think and talk yes. about um, workforce preparedness. Uh, and some would argue that at an even deeper level that there is actually a mismatch in the preparation itself. 
And so uh, what has ensued has been a, a really terrific uh, opportunity um, to engage the business community, both at the, at the federal level, at the state level, and at the institutional level, to talk about what workforce needs are, and then to reverse engineer through the education system opportunities to create uh, programs that develop those competencies. And so competencies we can think of generically as things you know how to do. Competencies with a capital C can be uh, new kinds of learning like creativity, like collaboration, uh, like problem solving, uh, mm -hmm. that uh, we're increasingly able through um, better technology and better definition of what that means on the ground to assess and to award small c credit for that work. And so the department has got two really good uh, experiments underway, one in competency-based education, and the other in providing federal financial aid to alternate providers of education. Mm -hmm. um, think boot camps. Think MOOCs. There are very specific outcomes in mind for sub-course level competencies. And what we want to test out is whether we can create a durable, uh, system in which competencies can be packaged, uh, uh, experiences gained, evidence of competency delivered, and then that put in a lockbox. I got that one, now well, how can I build the next one, and the next one, and the next one, and the next one after that? Um, stackable, portable credentials that don't require the investment of four years to develop some competencies, uh, and uh, are able to establish that you know what you say you know. This requires uh, a, a, a real focus on quality and on outcomes, and so we're building a whole new ways of uh, assessing quality that are based on very simple metric. Are students learning what the provider claims they're going to teach? Period. If they are, they're good. If they're not, they won't. For those of you in the charter school world, this sounds familiar. This is the fundamental bargain of, uh, of, of the, that K-12 experiment. Uh, this is what we're going to try to do over the next several years uh, in higher education. Uh, endorse alternate providers who have high quality for low-income students, provide federal financial aid to support that, and help institutions incorporate that kind of education uh, in, into their into their framework. I think this is where the E evolution moves to the yes. R revolution, <laughs> yes. and and we're really we're really pleased uh, pleased to be a part of it. Right. So, folks, that may sound simple. This is so radical <laughs> because it's what it's saying is that we are allowing third parties to come in because maybe they understand and can be the better connection of building social capital and building career ladders than what formal higher ed institutions are doing. Or they can do that in partnership with former ed, higher ed institutions, which I think is probably where most of them will be. But that's a very exciting transition because the same way that you think about the ancillary supports for the young people that you serve is the same way a college needs to think about that. Right? And with that said, I'm really excited to get us to Jimmy Walton so that we can hear from you. Um, so you could talk from the employer perspective. I'm sure you were not surprised by the undersecretary's comments from the proverse versus yours. So I'd love to hear your thoughts. So Wells Fargo was one of the largest employers in the country. Uh, 260,000 team members work for Wells Fargo here in the United States. And so that's a lot of jobs and a lot of team members in communities around the country that we know need to be strengthened in many ways, including education. So in 2014, about a third of our philanthropic dollars, about $80 million were dedicated to education in some way, shape, or form. A large percentage of that is through our scholarship programs with many organizations that you are familiar with, uh, Thurgood Marshall, Point Foundation, Asian Pacific Islander, UNCF, and those types of organizations. But we're, already we're also contributing directly to colleges and universities, as well as to local schools in communities. And helping people understand what is required in terms of work, in terms of attire, in terms of language, in terms of timeliness, some of the things that we might take for granted in my generation. Uh, I have a 19-year-old, so I kind of understand. Um, 
generational differences, but we are, so we're looking at not just the education, but everything else that uh, contributes to an individual's success. You know, we have the ability to provide mentors through our team member networks to many of the young people that participate in our scholarship programs so that they actually have someone that looks like them, that can talk to them about the world of work, that can talk to them about how you navigate a difficult boss, how you prepare yourself for an interview, how you react when you don't necessarily get that job or you may not get the increase that you wanted. And so the scholarship programs are one way that I think we're having an impact. Obviously, we have a partnership with Teach for America and are, are really looking at what our role should be in terms of education policy. You can imagine there are lots of policy issues that Wells Fargo is expected to take a position on. But education is, is foundational and fundamental to the strength of this country and to the strength of our cities and schools. And so it's something that we're continuing to assess in, in that space as well. When it, we talk about readiness for, for interviews, I had an opportunity to spend some time with a group of female students from the Thurgood Marshall Scholarship Fund about three um, years ago. And it was sort of a session that we called Unplugged. And there were women there from various backgrounds doing various types of jobs. You know, we had an, an, an army um, leader there and people from business, people from academia. And one of the things that they were asking us about was etiquette and dress. Uh, and it gave us an opportunity to really give some feedback in the moment. Because the way that they were expressing themselves to us uh, in terms of communication style, in terms of uh, attire, Get provided an opportunity to say that won't work if you are interviewing for a job at a conservative organization like Wells Fargo. You know, it may not work anywhere, but it certainly is not going to work for most of the corporate jobs that you're interested in. And the follow-up from that, I think, has been very powerful because many of those young students gave us their cards. Mm -hmm. They've stayed in touch with us. We know how they're doing, and they've reached out uh, when they've run into situations that felt uncomfortable for them. And that, that's really been important because a lot of them don't have that guidance and support at home. And I don't know if you've seen a film um, that Wells Fargo co-sponsored uh, called Go College. It actually follows the lives of five or six students in California and speaks to the complexity and dimension of what we know that we're dealing with in terms of per perhaps lack of support at home um, to go to school in addition to lack of money, and, and lots of other things. So I'll stop there. That's great. I'd love to hear from President Becker a little bit about how you've leveraged other partners to think about workforce and promote some of the persistence outcomes. And then I will end with Ami talking, mm -hmm. particularly about you as one of those partners and how you've done that successfully. Uh, leveraging workforce for us uh, includes a lot of internship and co-op opportunities, and, and we are not, we don't have an engineering program, we don't have a medical school, you know, we don't, we're primarily um, liberal arts as well as business and some health professions programs, social work, public health, etc. Uh, but we've actually moved into the co-op world and we're trying to move much more aggressively into the co-op space so that students have real world experience while they're in school as opposed to being um, graduating out into a workforce where it's, there's a disconnect, if you will, as um, Ted Mitchell referred to, between uh, what we think they need and what their employers think they need. So uh, what we did in an overarching way is now every major, every department has to have a signature experience. It has to be an experience for the students that takes them outside the classroom and gets them into some real world environment. Now some of those include study abroad and ser service learning opportunities, mm -hmm. but it also includes internship and co-op opportunities. So in the main, our main goal is to get people partnering and you know, we're fortunate to be in Atlanta, Georgia where there's a large number of corporate partners as well as an uncountable number of um, NGO and social um, and civil organizations. So we basically partner with everybody and anybody that will be there, but what we're seeing, and I'll, I'll put this at the last, is now when corporate headquarters are locating in Atlanta. They're now identifying particular universities to work with them, pipelines and career development. So um, I won't name names here, but we've been approached by several companies that say, we're going to recruit exclusively at a few universities for this marketplace, and we want to have a direct pipeline in. And so that's, I think that's, you're going to see more and more of that happening, at least in the cities and around the cities. Great. And so on me, as a social entrepreneur in this space that is negotiating between the employer negotiating with the higher ed institution 
and recruiting students within higher ed to learn these types of soft skills. Can you talk a little bit about what, what that journey's been like and what you've learned along the way? Yeah, so it, it, it was an accidental journey. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, sitting on the staff of Teach for America, recruiting all these awesome people, some of our former students, and having a bunch of other people say, how is it possible that they are not um, as prepared as we would have thought they would be to get over our bar, or honestly, other bars? Um, and so in the world of Braven, what we did is we actually started to recruit students at San Jose State to go through a really rigorous career simulated experience um, in their after or at extracurricular hours. Um, and the students started to rave about the experience. And what we did was nothing magical, but we put them in cohorts of five to seven, just like a posse. Um, and we gave them a young professional coach from the workforce who actually taught them really strong career readiness content. So for those of you who are familiar with the competency model at Teach for America, around operating and managing, reasoning and strategic thinking, building relationships and influencing others. And also we believe that we also had to help them think about stereotype threat, given the group of students that we were working with, mainly our first and their families to go to college, are often going to be minorities, at least in the professional workforce. And what we had was students who were signing up to do this like extracurricular thing in such large numbers and we had an awful website with like a landing page and we were using science fair poster board to recruit them, which the TFA recruiters out there know that would never happen in Teach for America world. Um, and we were just shocked by the demand from the students and so they started to talk about the experience with their professors and with some of the deans at San Jose State and actually the deans of the business school and the science school um, and the engineering school actually reached out to us and said, what would it actually take to have a stronger partnership? And given I'm a former sixth grade teacher and a talent nerd, I was like, we need a course. And I was like, they're never gonna give us this. Um, and I was surprised that they actually said, you know what, if we can work with you on it, we will do that. And so what happened to be this extra curricular thing has now become a three credit unit course at San Jose State uh, where we really focus on teaching the hard and I, I, ha I have a hard time calling them soft skills to be honest because honestly you can teach someone how to network, you can teach someone how to think about how they present themselves and you can actually see growth and mastery on those dimensions. Um, and so it's been really cool to see this really come about in partnership with this large state university and a set of deans. Um, and now we're creating a campus-based alumni experience for our students to go through, but the university will allow the course to go up to 250 students a semester, which is just incredible. And we've had this wonderful relationship with Career Services because they were the ones who started to say to us, like, there are so few of us um, in terms of the number of students. But also what's been fascinating to watch in our world is how the young professionals because this is what we all know as former teachers, you fall in love with people and you get outraged that it is not possible to see them at your companies in Silicon Valley. And then all of a sudden these young professionals started to refer their students into those companies because referrals are actually king in the world of the workplace. And so that's what's been so powerful to see is this large state university and a few people saying, hey, we wanna do something different, work with us to create something different, but also bring in the workforce, especially young professionals and millennials who wanna do good and also get their own professional development to be the coaches of these teams and watch this other ripple effect in terms of students actually getting looks at organizations and companies they wouldn't have. And so now we've entered into an early partnership with Rutgers Newark. Um, but San Jose State has 26,000 students and lots of them are first in their families to go to college and Rutgers Newark has 7,000 students and a lot of them uh, are the first in their families to go to college. Um, so it's just been really exciting in my opinion to see the two worlds beginning to come together. Um, but then also on the workforce side, it's also been really thrilling to see a number of workplaces saying, hey, we want early access to this talent because we can actually show them they, that different groups of students do have certain skills because we're measuring them against rubrics. Great. We don't have much time left. Boy, it goes fast, doesn't it? <laughs> but I want to take an extra three minutes to have our closeout, which is with the chancellor here, who's literally rebuilt and rethought the notions of what does it mean to have a stackable credential and be connected to the work environment, and if you could talk a little bit about that. Okay, sure. So in talking about the uh, stackable credential, I have to give you just 
a, a short blurb about the background of this. And what so, does it mean? And describe mm -hmm. it too. Sorry. Right. Go Thank ahead. you. <laughs> um, several, when we started reinvention uh, five years ago, one of the four goals of reinvention was to ensure that students received more credentials of economic value. And as I said, simply put, that means every credential that you earn at City Colleges either transfers into the workplace or transfers to a four-year institution. If it doesn't meet those two criteria, why are we wasting students' time and money? simply put. So we did an 18-month study of what that meant, and we found that seven industries would dominate our region over the next 10 years, and we aligned each one of our seven schools with each one of those industries and made them a center of excellence for those industries. Everything from healthcare to advanced manufacturing, um, culinary, hospitality, business, transportation, distribution, um, and logistics, and IT. Now they still have their core gen eds, their adult ed, and uh, one of our other schools is education, natural, uh, and natural and human sciences and our liberal arts. That still exists. But we also wanna become the experts at what's going to dominate our region to make sure we keep our city vibrant, make sure that Chicagoans are getting those jobs and are prepared for those jobs. Thus we created a program called College to Careers. Within each one of those industries, and including four-year institutions, when I say industries, we now have over 150 uh, partners that work with our colleges. They come in, they work with our faculty to redesign, rewrite curriculum, they serve as teacher practitioners, they give our students um, real-world experience by allowing them um, to work uh, in the workplace. They also work with us on soft skills, which is now going to become a credit course at City Colleges and mandated in each one of our um, career paths. With each one of those sectors, we had to figure out which jobs in those sectors would dominate, what our strengths are, what the employers wanted to see coming from us, and then we, uh, based on that, we built a uh, portfolio of programs. Those portfolio of programs can go anywhere from a six-month program all the way up through a master's. And with each one of, within each one of those industries, you know there could be several jobs. In healthcare, you can have EMTs, you can have surge techs, you can have respiratory, you can have a number of those jobs. And so we wanted to make sure we were able to fill all those gaps and that each credential stacked on top of each other. So if you started out and you came and you trained with us to become an EMT, if a year later, you know, after you settled in a workplace and, and got some financial stability, you now wanted to go on and do surge check, tech or medical billing and coding or respiratory or go on to be a nurse, you could take that EMT training, stack it to the next level and you can keep moving your way through. Each one of our uh, industry focuses have stackable credentials um, like that. So no credential is a dead end credential and each one stacks on top of each other. And it's also good because with our population, everyone is not starting in the same place. And some of our students, particularly our adult ed students, they need that quick win. They don't have two years to feed their families. So it works for uh, many reasons, but that's how it's set up. I want to um, thank this panel for a few things. One, for the Undersecretary for always being innovative and coming to this federal post and being fearless and never doubt, never doubt that people are invested in the status quo, okay? Mm -hmm. So when you want to make change, you have to be willing to be strong, right? So thank you for that, Undersecretary. Thank you, Ami, for doing what you're doing and navigating and building those bridges, and most importantly, building the social capital our young adults often don't have to get into new industries, right? Thank you, Jimmy, and you didn't get a chance to talk about it, but understanding that in corporations, particularly yours, that it's about lifelong learning and educational investment. Saying even how mid-career folks have opportunities to learn more to grow to the next level. And so we don't talk about that, particularly in companies, but what does it mean for them to be invested in the continuous learning so that they also have an equity agenda, so they can see the best talent rise, irrespective of race and class and gender. So thank you for that. Um, I also want to thank our President um, Becker here because I think, you know, how many states have the same access to the data and do not have an equity agenda, right? 
How many states in our union? Anybody? Guess. <laughs> Think of the 50 states in our union. And let me tell you, very few can say that they have closed the gap. Correct, Under Secretary? And yep. thinking clearly about graduation and making sure it is about equity. So thank you for that. And thank you, Chancellor, for um, being fearless. I have no doubt that you've taken on many hits yourself in doing that and saying, we cannot waste money, the students' money, and we cannot waste talent. And when you start from those two values, it's amazing what you can create to go forward. So with that, thank you to our panel. So are there uh, fearless one or two that can ask a question of our panel? Oh, mira que bueno, this is great. Well, you know what this means? We're probably, wow, I love it. Mm -hmm. Lifelong learners, let's yeah. keep asking questions. Um, I'm gonna take two questions because that's all I can take, but I'm sure that the panel here will be, they're gonna kick us out, that's why, see, the chancellor to my left is like, oh, <laughs> I love questions too. How about you start? Introduce yourself and what grade you teach or have taught. Hi, um, oh, that's odd. Uh, my name is Joy. I'm a high school teacher in Baltimore City. I was a 2009 core member there. Um, and my question, uh, particularly for those of you that work at higher ed institutions, is I'm not that old, but even for me, college was 10 years ago. Um, and a huge component of that was SAT prep and SAT preparation. Um, and even since the time where I've been out of higher ed and I'm now working with K-12, that has changed in the schools that expect certain SAT scores as a gateway to their institution um, is different for different schools. And we see Ivy Leagues um, putting less emphasis on it, but then still students and parents thinking that that is a crucial piece of college readiness. So my question as a teacher is how much emphasis should I be putting on that? Is that a parent education issue? And how important are some of those gateway tests for college acceptance? So I'm going to try to be controversial. And, and it all comes down to is where do you want your students to go to school? Meaning there are institutions, and there's basically, I'll, I'll, I'll say, claim there are two kinds of institutions of higher education in the United States of America today. Those who brag about who they keep out, which are the ones that actually emphasize the SAT score, and those who brag about who they graduate, which, like my institution. <laughs> and, and so if your goal is to see a higher percentage of your students going to those institutions that brag about who they keep out, then you should focus on SAT prep. But otherwise, you should be focusing on prepping students to be successful no matter where they go, including institutions that don't use the SAT as the bar, as a barrier. Right. Exactly. So I'll probably be a bit controversial, too, probably because I'm always a bit controversial, even when I'm not trying to be a bit controversial. Um, so the STAR scholarship, this was um, something that we talked a lot about. Um, the STAR scholarship uh, has two criteria. One for students that have a 3.0 GPA, and that means that they are working very hard. That, that, that doesn't mean that they may have the highest score on the ACT or SAT, but it does mean that they are working very hard in your classes and are learning something. The second one is what we call completion ready. Notice I did not say college ready. If I looked at the pure definition of college ready, it would be about who I kept out and who I, who I didn't let in. And guess what? I would not have been one of those people who went through the community college system that I'm now leading. So I think we need to start looking at this from a very different perspective. I think all too often I hear people talk to young people about get your bachelor's degree, get your master's degree. That's great if in fact what they want to be when they grow up requires that. I have a lot of students who have come back to community college who have bachelor's and master's degree that now means nothing for them in the real world. So I think what um, I would suggest we focus on is trying to find out what our young people want to be when they grow up. Are we really telling them what their real options are? And how well are we preparing them for that? I think that's what we should focus on. I'm going to add something from the professor perspective and the number that I had at the beginning of this. 
which is that 60% of the students are gonna go within 40 miles of their home to school. Six out of 10, no matter what we say, right Ted? They're gonna do that. And so with that said, if there's anything to focus on, it's to focus on that they can test out of remediation, math, and English at their local community college, if they do that, or at their local public four-year university. And I say that because we see so many students, so many students who may be focused on the SAT, feel beat down by that, and because of two or three points, are stuck in remediation for 16 weeks, are not in a school that has a boot camp, and what do you think happens to their score after 16 weeks? It doesn't go up. Exactly. So, I, so I actually do believe there is something you can do. Make sure they can pass those exams. And that is different. That bar can be reached. Most do not pass within points. So I have a particular perspective on that as someone who teaches in that system, and that is a much more manageable one. A much more manageable one. Let's go for the next question. Great. Hi, uh, my name is Nitsan Pelman. Uh, I run a company called Reup Education, and we partner with universities to re-enroll students that have dropped out of college, and then support them until they graduate through coaching. Um, I, my, I, I live in Silicon Valley in the Bay Area, and there is a fun conversation that I feel like I end up in almost every day about whether or not university is obsolete and sort of irrelevant at this point. Um, and I'm sort of curious about people on the panel's just perspective on how relevant will university be um, moving forward? And I know that we're sort of at the brink of this disruption um, in higher ed where people are questioning the value, and I'm sure that that's connected to the cost that's been rising for so long on this, but curious about how relevant people think it will be for the next five to 20 years. Okay, I'll volunteer to go first, because uh, we'll get this question a lot. And let, let me start with, and it's, um, it, it's, it's not meant to be anything other than an observation, but Silicon Valley is not the rest of the country and not the rest of the world. <laughs> um, and the tech industry is not representative of all jobs and all careers that one That's can right. have. Right. So let, let's start with um, the data, which is we have a bias towards data, um, I think, at higher education. Uh, if you look at the metro Atlanta region, which, you know, it's its own unique ecosystem, but it's, um, I think, more representative of much of the country than Silicon Valley. Over 90% of the new jobs that will be created in our metro area will require a bachelor's degree or more, over 90%. So that's one observation. The value of a college education is, the, actually the importance of a college education is only going up. Um, I'll get on my ho uh, high horse. The recession was more than an economic event. It was a recalibration of workforce and opportunity in this country. If you look at the unemployment during the recession, college graduates, the unemployment rate of college graduates peaked at five to six percent. Peaked at five to six percent. The people who were put out of work by the recession were the people that do not have an education beyond high school, and even worse, don't even have a high school degree. We are transitioning into a workforce that requires more education, not less, and we also, and I'll, I'll wrap this up by going to the other side, is colleges are particularly relevant for those who have had the least opportunity and start the most disadvantage. Those students do not thrive in an online, purely online world. They require a lot more support, much better environment around them, actually involvement with human beings, mentors, teachers, advisors, coaches, and everything else, and you're not gonna get that in an online MOOC world. So the reality is our relevance and value is only more important in the future than has ever been before. Yeah, I just wanna add in to this too. 70% um, uh, of Americans who are born at the bottom of the income ladder never make it to the middle, but a college degree makes you five times more likely to. And given the work that we've done has been a lot with San Jose State, I also have experienced this, like maybe it's not relevant. And yet when we're talking to the employers who are thinking about, you know, the Braven students as a part of their pipelines, we got into a conversation with a large tech employer who basically said, you know what, we have 50,000 roles. I had an MBA intern last summer do an analysis and there's seven roles at this company that do not have someone in it with a BA. I guess I'll end, I'll end this one. Oh, go ahead, Ted. You to, to, to pile on, 
Uh, so I, th I think it is true that a, a college uh, um, degree or certificate will be more important in the future than mm -hmm. it is now, and exactly right that it's, it's doubly true for the population that we've been talking about um, today uh, who have traditionally been excluded. I mean, let's just be honest about that, right? Absolutely. Excluded from these institutions. I think that the, uh, the, the, the Silicon Valley, the interesting part of the conversation isn't whether college is going to be important, it's what's co what college is going to look like. Exactly. And who is going to be allowed to deliver what we call college. And I do think that what we're seeing is we're seeing a dispersion of models now of how colleges work, what colleges uh, do. So what Mark is doing is very different from what the institution did five, ten years ago, right? What Cheryl is doing is very different from what City College was like before she arrived. Uh, so I think we're at a moment where we're, we, we actually are seeing a natural experiment underway about delivery models, delivery system, evaluation models, uh, the discussion about uh, certificates uh, and, uh, and, and credentials. So I think the more interesting part of the question is what's a college going to look like 10 years from now and to really embrace the kinds of innovations that we've heard about today. Yeah. And I, I think some of those voices are also to be provocateurs for innovation, and, that, and they represent that the same way for this room. Why is high school four years? Has anyone seen the senior year of high school in some schools? <laughs> I would say that's the loafing year for some. So you know why, right? What are these constructs? So we can't be afraid to, to have provocateurs. With that said, I am sorry they're going to kick us out, but I'm told and I'm behind it, hashtag evolving higher ed, put something out on, on your Twitter feeds, and thank you all for being here.